Hello, uh, AP Lang fans. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Mr. Delamar's um, another episode of Close Analysis Weapon Wielding 101. Remember our three tools are annotation, questioning strategies, and graphic organizers. As you can see, I already have um, my graphic organizer set up here um, on stage left. We have subject, occasion, audience, purpose, speaker, tone, and then our diction and syntax um, models over here. Um, by now, uh, you should have read the speech to the troops at Tilbury, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, um, in your book, on your AP Lang book on page 40. Um, it goes from 40 to 40, the top of 43, but the actual speech is just here on page 40 and 41. So, in just going through this, if you haven't read this, pause the video now and read and go ahead and do your annotation. I included a PDF version that looks like this where it's hard to see on here, you can kind of see on this side, but I did it on, so you have lined paper, so you can kind of write in the margins, do your questioning strategies. We'll just talk a little bit about what I see and then um, how to tie that to our um, rhetorical situation and our rhetorical appeals, right? And um, then I'm gonna have you write your own thesis sentence. How does Queen Elizabeth I use her, her rhetorical um, devices and her organization and structure of her speech to um, establish her purpose. And the subject matter, I hope that you've already read this, it, um, in the background, it gives you a little bit of background context of the situation. Um, the occasion is, uh, the, or the subject um, is war with Spain. And as we know, the Spanish Armada is parked off of um, the British Isles off of the coast of England in uh, the English Channel, right? And um, it's the largest, most dip, uh, well, heavily armed um, navy in the world at that particular time. And we understand that Queen Elizabeth and England, they're going, uh, they're on some hard financial uh, times. They've fallen on hard financial times and cannot go on the offensive. And so they're just waiting for the Spanish Armada to attack and they have limited numbers, they have a limited Navy, limited army. And so she has to use her powers of persuasion to get people to um, step up and really fight the fight. There are, she has traitors outside and inside. There's a lot of people who do not approve of a woman leading the country, you know, during this time. We're talking about the 15th century, uh, 16th century, 1588, right? So uh, 1588, there's a lot going on here. Um, war with Spain, you know, um, uh, hard economic times that already fits into the, the equation here. Um, and in, in addition, um, you know, part of the context is you have a, um, a queen versus a king, right? Queen Elizabeth is very young also now. She, they call her the virgin queen. You know, she was uh, in her late teens, early 20s um, and when the speech was made. She rides in and she meets her troops at Tilbury and she is out there among them, much against the advice of um, her um, nobles and her councilmen who thought that she should just let a man go in there and give the speech because there might be traitors in the army who would love to have an opportunity to make a little money or to get her out of the way so someone else can step up to the plate and you know, be a, a, be a king or someone else. All right, so um, she goes in, she's dressed in armor. Um, oh yeah, hopefully you have watched the video too of the speech. So watch the video because Kate Blanchett really does a good job of capturing young Queen Elizabeth in her armor, on her horse, there out amongst her soldiers on the field, addressing them and trying to pump them up 
to go to war. So we already know that the purpose is sort of to, um, to inspire troops to, to go do battle, right? We know that the speaker is young and um, somewhat inexperienced, young and female. Right? So these are all going to sort of tie in. Notice how she begins with my loving people, you know, and um, I'll, I'll use my loving people. And um, if we want to tie that to our word choice here, you know, what is she creating when she calls them? She creates a sense of sort of familiarity. And hopefully that... I'm not sure you can see this green. This green doesn't show up all that great. This is purple. All right, my loving people. And so she's sort of, um, you know, when she uses these first person pronouns, we have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we, we commit ourselves uh, to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. But I assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful. I do not live to distrust my faithful and loving people. So my loving people, she's already said that twice, you know, um, and establishing a sort of credibility. And you could even tie that to pathos, you know, this um, sort of familiarity um, that she's establishing there. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that under God, I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore, I am come amongst you, as you see at the time, not for recreation and to sport. I'm not here for my recreation or sport, but being resolved in the midst of the heat of battle there's that resolve in, uh, to live and die among, live and die among you all to lay down for my God. We bring in God into this again, and for my kingdom and my people, my honor and my blood, even in the dust. So I love this. You know, she starts out in in the beginning. She, um, you know creates this sense of, you know, her, her purpose in the intro, see, is unity, right? And that you could tie to pathos. And there's a certain um, a credibility about that. You know, we're all in this together, you know. <clears throat> um, it, it, and she also said when she shifts from we to I, she uses that first person plural we, us, our, and then my kingdom to remind us that she is in charge, right? And be, her resolve is also a good word, uh, you know, to let us know that she is determined, right? Um, you know, let tyrants fear. I have always behaved myself that under God I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill. So that she is earning sort of the respect, you know, you are loyal, you are uh, of goodwill, you know, we have God on our side. So all of these things can tie in this, all of this word choice here could be used to establish uh, her credibility or the emotional content of that, right? You know, think about who her audience is, you know, how does this tie to her audience, you know, um, who are poor and downtrodden, right? Um, and it gives them the sense of unity. You know, they uh, are people um, that um, are some, uh, have been defeated but already by, by war. And so uh, defeated um, countrymen who need um, an uplift. You know, you can tie this to your to your audience here, right? Um, and then she goes on to say, I know I have the body of but a weak and feeble woman. You know, why does she, why does she bring these words uh, weak and feeble? 
You know, why would she want to, you know, she's not weak and feeble. She's standing out there amongst them. She is um, owning the fact that she's a woman. She's not a king, right? But, and here's that contradiction again, but I, you know, for I, I don't want to uh, stand out here. I'm not going to not stand out in front of the armed multitudes for fear of treachery, but I assure you I do not desire to live. And then she uses that same construct here. So she uses these sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, contrasting ideas, um, you, know, you know, if if this but that happens, you know, kind of construct, I have the heart and stomach of a king, right? This very visceral language that she uses here. You know, it gives us the impression that she is young and female, but she is tough. You know, she's got, you know, we talk about, I mean, the heart and guts of a king and the king of England, too, which is something to be proud of. Again, you know, there you can hear them hooting and hollering, you know. Um, and I think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe. So here we have foul, when she talks about. Um, you know, foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any other prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which rather than any dishonor shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. So the rewarder of virtues. So I myself am going to take up arms. I myself will be your general judge. So you can you could talk about the repetition of this in under syntax, or you could talk about it in terms of you know uh, her, her word choice here. I will take up arms. I will be your judge. And this, there's a logic to this word choice right here, logos, because we know that the people are poor and I will be the rewarder of your virtues in the field. So there might be something in it for you. You know what I'm saying? Um, I know already for your forwardness, you have deserved rewards and crowns and we Notice the we is capitalized. Do assure you in the word of a prince, they shall be duly paid you. And there's that time to that logical, you know, what do men um, need? Um, they need some money to do this, right? We need to be taken care of. The people are hungry. You know, again, England is uh, part of the context. We're on hard economic times. We, um, in the meantime, my lieutenant general shall be in my stead. Then whomever prince commanded a more noble and worthy subject, not doubting by your obedience to my general, by your concord in the camp, concord in the camp, and your valor in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory over those enemies of my God, my kingdom, and of my people. And that that construct there, you know, that parallel structure that she uses, that, um, parallelism, you know, is a, a good thing that you could talk about, is a, um, it creates a rhythmic effect and it adds a sense of symmetry to her argument, right? Her tone here, I think it would be safe to say that she is, um, you know, in, she is passionate, also defiant, right? And, um, she, but she's also humble, you know? So all of these things, she's humble, she's passionate, and she's defiant. So I would like for you to go through here and just, you can, you know, this is just a real quick sketch, a real quick uh, run through where we're just kind of talking with the text. And what I would like for you to do now, once you've you know, taken in this process, watched the video, you've already done your um, um, 
graphic organizers, I would like for you to write a thesis sentence. How does she use her elements of style? How does she use uh, rhetorical um, appeals to establish her purpose? You know, and you can do it uh, in, in terms of elements of style or word choice. You can do it in terms of the way she structures her argument, the ordering of ideas, you know, um, and how does that contribute to the overall tone that she is establishing, which can be defined in three very different ways. Humble, you know, there's a sense of humility, but she's also passionate and defiant. And how, and how effective was this? We know part of the context of this is that, you know, England defeated the Spanish Armada. That's something that's important to tie into your, for your sophistication points. A lot of it did have to do with the fact that England was blessed with um, offshore winds that it prevented the Spanish Armada from coming to shore because there was such strong winds um, that they weren't able, it was in the spring, it was like, you know, the uh, April and May winds were blowing so hard that the ships could not come ashore. And so that really kind of helped them because they had to sit out there and, you know, wait. And in the in meantime, it gave the, um, you know, English army an opportunity to defend and build, you know, defenses and uh, strategize in that way because going on the offensive was not really an option for them. They really didn't have the Navy to do it. Um, and we're talking about the, you know, 16th century. So, you know, it's not like they could just fire some rockets over there at them or something. All right, so have fun with that. I hope you've enjoyed this little breakdown of uh, the speech to the troops at Tilbury. And um, what I'm looking for is your, you can just, you know, snap a picture of this paper right here if you printed it out and wrote on it, or you're just, you know, you created a um, graphic organizers to go along with it. I know mine's kind of sparse, but you can base it on what I've, the questioning strategies that I was using here and some of the things that I laid out for you, you can borrow from, but I want, the main thing is I want a solid thesis, right? That establishes her stylistic elements, rhetorical appeals, structure, whatever you want to focus on and how that establishes her effectiveness as a speaker. Okay. Have fun.